This episode is brought to you by LootCrate.com. You can save 10% on any new subscription at trylootcrate.com forward slash black cat. Just enter promo code BRIDGE10 for 10% savings. Is imagination simply contained in the mind? Or does it tap into an unseen world with messages waiting to be told? There is a place where legends cross over into our world, where strange visions and whispers beckon, and superstition takes hold. Step into the Black Cat's shadow. Welcome back to the Black Cat Shadow. I'm your host, Andy, podcasting from Kansas City, Missouri. And I'm Phantom Dark Dave, coming at you from the heart of Texas. With us today, a filmmaker who has dabbled in many different genres, but it was influence in the horror genre that got him on this show. He is the creator of Dead Scared, Corpses, Nightmare Man, and his most recent horror film, which is available on Netflix, called The Black Room. Please welcome Rolf Konevsky. Welcome to the show. Hi, everybody. Hey, Rolf. Uh, yeah, yeah. We're very excited to talk to you tonight about some of your horror movies. And uh, so I wanted to start off uh, talking to you about uh, one of your movies uh, called Nightmare Man that you did a few years ago. This is an amazing place. We're the only ones up here. When your best friend's about to tie the knot with Mr. Just Right, it's cause to celebrate. So let's get this party started. <laughs> I heard something. Anyone there? See anything? There's someone out there. Somebody and uh, yeah, I, th- I thought it was an uh, interesting movie. It was unpredictable, and I <laughs> so I definitely appreciate that in the story. We're looking at Nightmare Man, definitely you can see some influences in there from maybe some older movies. But what what are some films that kind of have inspired you? to make your own films? Oh, uh, well, um, starting off, I, and I've, I've talked about this. Um, my father, uh, who's a film editor, uh, he did a lot of, uh, documentaries, but he also worked on a, a couple of, uh, famous and infamous horror films back in the day. Um, uh, he was actually, uh, editor on blood fucking freaks and supervising editor of just before dawn and Ganshin Hess, which is a pretty famous film that uh, Spike Lee remade recently. um, so anyway, yeah, he gets some credits, but uh, he introduced me to the world of Abbott and Costello movies. And uh, the first one I saw, because I grew up in New York, and uh, every Sunday at 11.30 in the morning on Channel 11, they would show an Abbott and Costello movie. And I caught the end of Abbott and Costello movie, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, with Boris Karloff, which I thought was great, and fell in love with them. And then Abbott and Costello Frankenstein and their monster movies especially were a major influence. So I kind of fell in love with the, the horror comedy genre, you know. Um, and then over the years, um, became a huge fan of Fright Night and American Wolf in London and Night of the Creeps and Tremors. So um, I've always found that uh, combination of, of horror and humor to be, uh, to be an interesting challenge. And I, I like that line of, you know, back and forth of making it funny at one moment and then scary, but, uh, you know, keep you guessing what's going to happen next. So... Those films had a big influence on sort of that, and of course, Evil Dead, Sam Raimi, and being, you know, when he did the movie at the age of, you know, 20, 21 or 22, and uh, yeah, so so that, and um, yeah, Sam Raimi, and I guess Steven Spielberg, because I, I started, I saw E.T. at the perfect age, and fell in love with his movies, and knew he had done his first professional film when he was 21, the Night Gallery episode, so I was sort of... Yeah, got a video camera when I was 13, started making my own home movies at the time and wanting to like do my first professional thing, you know, around then too. And I was lucky enough with support of my friends and family um, to, uh, to do There's Nothing Out There when I was uh, 20 years old. So that was my first big professional break into the industry. 
Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, to be able to do your first project that young, I mean, because, you know, I think, yeah, a lot of a lot of us movie fans, you know, at some point in time, we have wanted to make our own movies, whether it's, you know, just something in our backyard with our friends. So it's cool that uh, that you actually got that opportunity. It's so young. And so the idea of the Nightmare Man, I think it's an interesting concept. And, and I mean, was there something that wh- where did you get that idea from or where did that come from? Well, Nightmare Man, um, it was a few things. I was, I was sort of, I had just done a movie called Jacqueline Hyde, which was a female take on the Jekyll and Hyde story. And uh, we were, I'm sorry, I was waiting for post-production on that one, and I was creatively wanting to do something else. And I sort of came up with the idea of Nightmare Man. Um, it was definitely a little inspired by uh, the famous trilogy of terror with Karen Black, the, uh, the Zuni fetish doll. So I thought that would be kind of a cool, with, you know, with the full-size mask versus the little doll. And um, and playing around with possessions, I I kind of wanted to do a horror movie that sort of started in the '70s and had kind of the suspense and the shadows. You're not quite sure, you know, what's going on with the scene in the car. Then you move more into the, sort of the slasher films of the '80s and the Friday Thirteenth stuff, and then you get more into the '90s with like the Army of Darkness and the supernatural elements. Um, so I thought it would it would be a nice if I if I pulled it off, sort of take you through the the decades of the horror genre and, and sort of a love letter to you know, films I grew up with and loved, you know, so at the time and, and hopefully have some surprises, you know, that, uh, come out in the third act. Whereas I, there's, there's one twist that is sort of obvious. And that was sort of to lead the audience down to say, okay, this is going to happen. And that does happen, but that sort of doesn't prepare you for the big twist. Um, which is the, you know, the supernatural element of the story. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I mean, I definitely appreciated that. You know, I, and I don't want to go into spoilers cause I definitely want people to check this movie out. But yeah, I mean, like I said, that that twist, like there was a couple of twists in it, you know, in that third act, which is crazy. Um, <laughs> and I, so I really appreciated that. Um, and uh, and and wow, you know, I I definitely, you know, there was definitely a recognizable face in this movie, Richard Mull. Like that was really cool that you got him to be on your in your movie. Yeah, he was um, uh, one of the producers on the film, uh, Esther Goodstein, uh, who I've worked with many times. Uh, she she had known Richard from way back because she used to be an extra and she worked on the Flintstones with him. And uh, we were shooting in Big Bear, and he lives in Big Bear. And she found out about it, so she gave him a call because he was local and said, hey, would you be interested in doing a cameo in our film? And he kind of remembered her, and he said, sure. So uh, he came down for a night, and it was great getting him in the movie and uh, you know at, at a great rate. And uh, we... Uh, you know, and, his appearance it was awesome and I you know, I, I also love House, another great horror comedy that he was wonderful in. So uh it was it was really fun to work with him. And of course, uh it was not my first time working with Tiffany Sheppes, but um, you know, I kind of wrote that role for her and uh she was able to play. she had just had a baby, so that was her first movie um after she had had the baby a few you know, like uh, half a half a year earlier. So that was that was cool to work with her too. Yeah, I definitely liked the that you know at the beginning that car scene you know I thought that was really suspenseful, and like you said it it, it definitely has that you know kind of the seventies vibe. I, I, it definitely there's some shots there, especially where there's there's one scene you know, where it involves like uh, the hazard lights and you see something in the hazard lights. I think that was a really cool shot there, and and, and I you know so I, I like there's definitely some cool cinematography, some good shots going on. Thanks. I'm I'm very proud of that sequence. That that I wanted to see if I could really build up this this long, and it's it's about a ten minute sequence to build up the tension and and bit by bit. We and we, the other thing is that was that was actually the last night of shooting at Big Bear. It was a long day. We were shooting till dawn, um, but we had a lot to shoot, and it was one camera. But we did I think it was probably a sixteen hour day, so it was a long day. But we did seventy eight we did seventy eight setups in one day. We were like, we did 26 setups before lunch, and everyone's like, oh, we're doing great. I said, yeah, we just got 52 more to go. And they're like, you're kidding. I'm like, nope. And, you know, because all those pieces, you get you know, the, the, the mirror reflections and around the car. And I, I knew, I mean, I had the whole thing shot listed. I do very detailed shot lists. And I knew what I wanted. And we got all the, those bits. And, like, that was one of the incredible. I have to, Paul Dang, who shot that film for me, you know, workhorse, incredible. So, you know, to pull that off uh, was, was, uh, was really cool. And I, and I really liked that. And I think, and I'm happy because it's, that's, that's one of the kind of slow burn things that, you know, sometimes in you know, the genre people have patience to and sometimes they don't have patience for it. They're like, get to the action already. And I really wanted to kind of 
you know, kind of a little Hitchcocky and sort of build up that suspense and, and pay off before we get into, you know, slasher fun, you know. Oh yeah, definitely. And, and it was, it was a good lead into the, the craziness later. And so like, I, I, you know, there's a lot of night, like primarily the film takes place at night. And so there's, you know, I'm sure there's like a lot of challenges having to film at night with the lighting and things like that. There were a lot of challenges with that, especially inside the house. Because what I didn't really realize is that we were, if you, if you remember the movie, when they're inside the main living room in the house, there were glass doors on either side of the room. And when it's all nighttime, they become mirrors. So literally you're shooting into two mirrors that reflect everything back and forth. So trying to hide the crew and the camera equipment <laughs> while you're like, okay, where can we? Cause I'm, and then it was like, oh my, because you know, we were there at daytime when we were scanning the location and the, and the windows. And then all of a sudden, like, oh, they're all mirrors. And this is very difficult trying to get the movement. and the Because the, the, I really like to move the camera around a lot and not seeing things you're not supposed to see while you're doing that. So yeah, that, was, that was another challenge on top of it. Plus we were shooting... Um, in the summer, so we had really short nights. We had seven-hour nights. So uh, the, I think the shoot was originally supposed to be 12 days. I think we did 15 uh, that we knew just because in summer nights you just you never have time to do it, and we weren't doing day for night. So <laughs> Yeah, So and you mentioned earlier that um, you'd actually shot like scenes in the beginning of the movie later on, so you, you didn't really shoot in a chronological order. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, in, in, rarely in movies do you get the luxury of shooting in chronological order. I was able to do it like once, for a movie called Tomorrow by Midnight, which I really love, but uh, most of the time you have to jump around and uh, and, and do what you what you need to do. Um, yeah, the, the there's there is a funny story, sort of a little twisted funny story if you want to hear it. Um, yeah, yeah, sure. When we shot the film, uh, uh, Blythe uh, Metz, who plays um, Ellen, the, the the woman being taken up there, you're not sure if she's crazy or, or what's going on. She really gets into the character, and, and she has to be running through the woods and screaming and all this stuff. And when she comes to the house. You know, she really worked herself out, and she was sort of getting scared. The actor who was playing the Nightmare Man was, was scaring her, and she was working herself up. And we were shooting in Big Bear, and we had two, two houses that we, we had, but there were other houses in the area. And it, we were shooting at night, so it was like midnight, 1 o'clock, and she was getting a little loud. And this one house um, is a place where I guess th- these people bring younger people there who have been abused or are dealing with issues. So... <laughs> hearing this woman screaming for her life was the last thing they wanted to hear, so it started freaking everybody out, and I think we had to pay them some money to, <laughs> to sort of appease them. And it was like, oh, that's uh, – sorry about that. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Another thing that I that I appreciated was the special effects. I, I think, you know, for, you know, a lower-budget movie, they, they, they weren't – you know, they were, they were pretty good. And, you know, it looks like you guys had some really talented special effects artists in the, on the shoot. Yeah, we uh, we had um, uh, Jeff Farley, who I've worked with a few times, and uh, Chris Bergschneider were our, our two practical effects guys on that movie. And um, yeah, they had to do some some pretty detailed stuff. And and, and again, all of the effects in that movie are uh, practical, uh, which I always uh, prefer and, and love to do. Um, there was only a few enhancements at the end with the smoke, uh, obviously, and uh, and actually there was one that you never even know as an effect. But when the side of the car is revealed to be all uh, chewed up. By the way, that was my car. We destroyed my car on that movie because um, <laughs> when, when the, when the, when at one point when the body falls, we, we did smash the roof so we couldn't, yeah, so I literally, uh, so that was too bad. But um, yeah, but he, he did like uh, CGI scratches on the side of the car and they're so perfect you, no one ever knows that it's an effect. But, um, but all the, the guts and the blood and the uh, demonic stuff was, uh, was, yeah, well done on set practical and you know, with, uh, you know, we had, eye, you know, contacts and all that kind of stuff. So you're blind, you can't see anything. And <laughs> it was, yeah, it was ambitious for a 15 day shoot. Yeah, it was a, it was a, it was a tight film to do and it was all done independently. So, you know, what was even harder than that was getting the film released and, you know, having it find an audience because, you know, nowadays, you know, it's sort of almost easier to make a movie than it is to get distribution for a movie because there's so many horror films out there. And uh, we had a lot of, uh, it took a couple of years to actually find the distribution deal. Well, yeah, and it got picked up on the eight films to die for. That, that's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, I, I uh, went down to Comic-Con. Um, we, we, we had opened the film up. We had four-walled the film for a week at the, at the theater in L.A., and we got some good reviews, and we had a rep, and, but everyone was saying there's a lot of horror films, and there's nobody big in it, and you just couldn't sell it. And they're like, you know, try, you know, try to sell it as a thriller. Don't sell it as a horror film. Nobody wants a horror film. 
and I was just depressed. So I went down to Comic Con and I was walking around and saw After Dark had a table there, and they had just started the, the, the year before was their first year. And I know Mike Mendez who had done the Grave Dancers that was part of the first year's After Dark. So I went there and I said, "How do you pick films for your festival?" And they're like, "Well, we have deals with Lionsgate and we go to Toronto and Sundance and you know, the big festivals. But are you a filmmaker? Do you have a film?" And I said, "Yes." So I gave them a copy of the film. I, of course, had it with me with the package, and everyone thought I was crazy, like saying, "Well, they're looking for bigger films because they, you know, they're like Death of the In Stone that Stan Winston produced, ten million dollar film, and all this stuff." I said, "Well, you never, no, you don't try." And um, a couple of weeks later, I get a call from them, and they're like, uh, "We lost your film. Um, could you send it again?" I said, "Sure." So I send it over again. Uh, the next day, actually, our our rep officially quit the film, saying she can't sell the movie. Um, nobody wants horror. There's nothing I can do. Sorry, because everyone had turned it down. Lionsgate said no. Sci-Fi Channel said no. Everybody was like, no, no, not interested. And then, uh, like, literally the next day, I emailed After Dark just to see if they'd gotten the DVD. And they wrote me right back, said, we got it. We watched it. Showing some other people in the company, get back to you shortly. And two hours later, like, we love it. We want it as part of the film festival. And boom. So all of a sudden, the film that no one would touch goes through After Dark, gets picked up and released through Lionsgate, who turned it down, Sci-Fi Channel, which turned it down, and I hear it made like $6 million because, you know, got into Walmart and all those things by itself. That title was one of the best-selling titles of that year for a while, and um, it just shows it's the package of the film. I think the film's good, too, but, it, you know, it's not necessarily when you get rejected, it's not necessarily your film. It's just, you know, falling into the right grouping of your film, which is what I always say, to filmmakers is don't let these rejections take to you. It's not like you made a bad movie. It's just that nobody's paying attention. Um, and sure enough, once it finally got into the right way, you know, by me myself, just, you know, <laughs> getting into the right the hands, the film got a big release and, and made other people a lot of money. Not myself, but a lot of other people a lot of money. <laughs> All right. I want to jump in there with that. I, uh, <laughs> okay. No, it's such a good segue because I was one of the people – who bought the entire second season at one time at a Best Buy for like 80-something dollars. I, oh, okay. uh, I had loved the first season, and as soon as I saw that, this, that they were even making a season two, I remember um, your cover specifically, and what I can say was I, I, I laid them out and I watched them all as fast as I could, and I remember dividing it up four by four, and, and I won't name all the titles, but I remember there was four good ones and yours was one of the good ones, and then four of ones that were like, well, these were okay. Um so that, that was kind of cool, and, and ugh, not to step on anybody's toes, but that was the last good season, I think, <laughs> that they had of those. Those other – the three and four seasons kind of went a little haywire, but um, – Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it was really... all pickups, but I'm glad you enjoyed mine. Because my film got – I mean, I was very surprised because, I mean, if you go to IMBD and all these places, you know, you, you, the user comments, you never know. But I, I thought the, the, the Nightmare Man would have been more embraced, but people – I think maybe because there's a good sense of humor to it, too, because there are funny things on purpose in that movie, and people are looking for just terrifying movies, and this was a kind of a throwback and a little, a little retro feel into the 80s, but um, it sort of put a lot of people off, and I, I was surprised that we didn't get a, a better response to, um, from people. They just, uh, I, didn't, I don't think they understood what it was, maybe. <laughs> Yeah, and you know how it goes with horror movies. I mean, a lot of people just watch them at home, and you never get to hear the true reaction from the diehard horror fans. You know, that's yeah. why we do this. We we like to get your voice out there and get your movies out there. And uh, it's so funny you said that the film didn't have anybody big in it, at least what they were looking for, because I had known Tiffany already from other films. I remember she was in Bloody Murder Part Two, and then she was in Homesick, which Adam Wingard did uh, in two thousand. Yep six or something like that um and i'm gonna use her to get us to your newest film on netflix the black room because she makes an appearance in this again I can't believe we finally got our own home I told you we'd get there <laughs> As it turns out, young Maggie Black had a dark secret. The woman that used to own our house. How do you know Margaret Black was into the occult? There was just that party in her parents' basement. I believe it was in the early 70s. <laughs> What's an incubus? The demons of lust and desire. But if you're not careful, it will literally eat you alive. I am the god of hellfire!
<laughs> yes, she does. Well, I, I worked with Tiffany like eight times now. She's also in The Hazing, which you call Dead Scared, and Corpses, and, uh, um, and, and Nothing Out There, and I mean Night, Nightmare Man. And then, yeah, so I've, yeah, she's, she's a good friend of mine, and I try to put her into everything you know, that I've done at some place because I, I knew she was a good actress, and at that point she really hadn't gotten her big break. And The Hazing was really one of the films that, and she says it's one of her favorite films that put her on the map, and people said, oh, she's not only you know, cute, but she can, she can act too. So <laughs> I was I was happy that uh, you know I helped launch her and then Frankenstein syndrome or you know and stuff like that she's done some really good work. Really cool. Yeah, I was actually going to ask if that just kind of happened that way or if you personally knew her and you just kept bringing her in. Uh, she's definitely a talent. I met her um, at the American Film Market, which is a, a big um, uh, once a year in, in California down in Santa Monica. She at one point had her own distribution company. She'd started up to try to like get some films out there because she started with Trauma and she was in Trauma and Juliet. And I met her there, and I was looking for money for the hazing, and I gave her the script, and she read it, and she loved the part of Marsha. And it took a couple of years before we could actually get the money together, but I brought her in, and we had we actually the producer made her come in a lot to audition for that role. But I was so happy that finally she she got the role because I thought she would be perfect for it. And um, and then from that point on, we uh, yeah we started working together pretty consistently. Yeah, I was. Uh... It was funny. I was watching Sharknado 2 the other day, and she popped up in there, too. I'm like, she's everywhere. She has established herself to be, you know, a known oh, horror Well, icon. she just did the big, you, you know, the, the, you know, the big right? one she's in now. No, no, the one coming the one coming out, touring now, that she has a really big role in, and she's great. Oh, uh, oh I thought she, yeah, because the big movie, no, Death House. Uh, but, v- yeah, Victor okay. Crowley, Hatchet 4. Oh, that's right. I just saw something about yep. that the other day. Oh, yeah. She, she's oh, going to yeah. be yeah, with the Hatchet time. Army. This this is going to give her convention appearances for years to come. Yep. <laughs> and she's, really, yeah, she's got a really good role in it. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes. it, also, in the black room, now, Tiffany, she just has, you know, I consider it cameo because I'm like, oh, look, there she is again. But to some people, it's just a minor role. But there was a lot of people in this movie, and it, it just – it brought your story to life. I mean, you were really blessed with a great cast. And I mean, you managed to feed my appetite very, very well. You had, you know, Natasha Henstridge, which everybody knows from Species. You had Lynn Shea from Insidious. Um, I think Dominique Swain from Face Off, the John Travolta movie. Um, yeah. And then just a little catch 22 that made me really happy is James Duvall popped up and he is one of my favorites because he was in a clown at midnight, which is a guilty pleasure for me. So, oh, yeah, <laughs> um, okay. you managed to show me people that I already knew and loved. But, man, introducing uh, I hope I get his name right. Lucas is it Hessel or Hassel. Uh, he was the Apple. main guy in the movie yep. and he was mesmerizing. Um, yeah, no, he was great. He was a, he was a great find. And, and, and we got to him through Natasha. Um, yeah, the story uh, of the Black Room, if you want to talk quickly about the cast, um, well, I knew a bunch of them. I'd I known Dominique Swang, and, and, uh, and, he, and, she also, and we also knew James Duvall, so we had a few connections with them. Uh, but um, uh, Natasha, we were, well, the, the, so it was produced by Cleopatra Records. Uh, they were starting a film company, and they've been doing a bunch of horror films now. And this was one of their first films, and they wanted some names in the movie. And it was a low budget, but they were willing to go sag and, and pay some money. So, well, we didn't have a casting director because they were trying to save money on casting directors. So the first person I thought, Lynn Shea, to play, you know, uh, Mrs. Black, was perfect. And they really wanted her. So we went back and forth with her a few times and finally got her to do the movie. And, and she was great to work with and, and uh, you know, real collaborator as well as a wonderful actress. And, um, you know, I've been a fan of her work for years. Um, but then they wanted somebody else, another big name on it. And we were making offers, but we weren't getting any responses because... The, uh, the gatekeepers of agents and managers, since they didn't know who Cleopatra was or anything, they, they were just ignoring us. So I don't think the actors even knew that they were getting offers out there. And it was like two weeks before we were going to shoot this movie, and we still didn't have our lead. So, and we couldn't cast all of Dominique and everybody else until we knew who was playing the lead performances. So uh, what happened was I, I wound up getting a little bit under the weather, and I went to a CVS uh, pharmacy up the street. And lo and behold, I'm standing in line next to Natasha Henstridge. And I recognize her. And I'm like, oh, I'm like, I'm so I go to the counter. She goes to a different counter, and I text one of the producers. I'm like, yes, I'm, I'm online. This is Natasha Henson. She'd be great for the role of Jennifer. And he's like, talk to her. And it's like, <laughs> excuse me, and, you know, it's like, talk to her. You know, I was like, I can't just go up to her and talk to her. It's like, you know, well, you, you, these opportunities don't come along. So I waited until she left the store, 
And I kind of went up to her parking lot. I'm like, Natasha answers. He goes, yes. I'm like, hi, I'm Ralph Nesky. I'm a filmmaker. I'm making a movie in two weeks. And are you available? There's a horror film. And she, and she was very nice. I'm, I would think she thought I was crazy. But I gave her my card. And she said, well, contact. She asked me, I am available. You know, contact my agents. We did. Called four times. They gave us the runaround. Nothing happened. And then, like, five days later, she called me back directly because she had my card. And she said she didn't hear anything. What happened? I said, well, we we're trying to get to you. But and she's like, send me the script directly. We did. And, like, 48 hours later, she said, yes, she'll do it. And then she said, who's playing the lead actor, the husband? I said, we don't have anyone yet. She said, I have this actor who I worked with in an independent drama that I think might be good. And we, you know, got along well. So I said, okay. And I talked to him on the phone and he turned out to be the best person we could possibly cast. And that's how we got Natasha and then Lucas. So casting in the CVS pharmacy parking lot. That's a great story. <laughs> I love hearing really cool <laughs> things like that. And yeah, he, yeah. <laughs> You know, the thing about Netflix, too, it's kind of – it had a reputation of their horror genre. You never knew what you're going to get, and it seemed like more times than not, it was a horror movie that you regretted You know, spending an hour and a half watching. And the poster kind of grabbed me, and, and you know, I could pick anything. And I was like, well, this looks kind of cool. I, you know, I like the story. I'm going to go ahead and watch it. And just the opening sequence you did with you know, Lynn Shea and everything, I was – it truly captivated me. And – um I love the background stuff and some things I want to talk to you about as well. I got just a couple more questions about it, but sure. you know, we talked about nightmare man and your inspiration. Where, so where did you conjure up the ideas for this movie? Okay. Well, the black room, um, it was actually a script I wrote a while ago, which, which was the weird thing about it. Cause I had written the script about 12 years ago. Um, when I was working with, uh, another actress uh, who had done some stuff with Gabriella Hall, who was known for other films and uh, audiences, and um, it never got made, but it was there on the pile. And I thought, well, I'd, I'd, liked, I'd always liked kind of sexy horror. And, and there was a series of books called the Hot Blood series. And I always felt that there's a real audience for erotic horror, even though there's very few movies about it. Um, but, of course, there's plenty of vampire stuff and True Blood. And then, you know, of course, then television with American Horror Story. Now, it, it's funny. Now it's extremely, extremely popular on television, but... All the, the movies are PG-13, you know, and I, James Wan's great and I love his films, but everything's these sort of possessed kids and, you know, PG-13 horror movies. So I thought it would be nice to kind of go back and do, you know, uh, an adult film, you know, a film that has adults in it and deals with sexuality. And, um, and then The Incubus, is, which is the, our main villain, is something that there's been very few films about. Uh, so I said, well, that's something different. You don't usually see a movie about Incubus. It's usually just a ghost or a possessed spirit or something like that. Hey guys, I want to let you know about Loot Crate. Loot Crate is offering all of our listeners 10% off a new subscription. All you gotta do is enter promo code BRIDGE10. Um, So you're probably wondering what Loot Crate is. So basically Loot Crate is a monthly mystery subscription box that gives you the best in geek and gaming gear. You could get anything from like pop vinyl figures, uh, comics, magazines, books. You get a t-shirt in every box and just other stuff it's like comic con in the box and you know for less than twenty dollars a month you get a bunch of stuff and you have until the 19th of every month at 9 p.m pacific to get in on that month's box and you know by supporting loot crate you support the black hat shadow this month um the theme is unite 2.0 it's like voltron power rangers uh, DC Comics, which I particularly like, um, and Overwatch. Again, sign up, just go to trylootcrate.com forward slash black hat and enter code bridge10 and you'll get 10% off your subscription. We return you now to your regularly scheduled program. So I thought something play that feeds off sexuality and, and, and seduces, you know, and it's in a way to me that's always an intriguing thing well if you see a, a horrible monster or, or a ghost or a slasher of course you're going to run away from that but if it's something that gives you pleasure that feels good like the vampire mythology you know the, the seduces women it's harder to fight something that feels good so um so that's where the concept came from and then you know little nods to movies like the entity and uh, the legend of house and uh, amityville horror obviously um you know and some of the some of the some, some stuff way back when so, uh, yeah, that was, uh, that, was, that was sort of the basis. Man, so glad to hear you say that, too, because I remember when I was watching it, I was picking up on senses of, like, the entity and even some Nightmare on Elm Street-type uh, atmosphere, you know, the bathtub sequence and everything. I just, 
it took me back a little bit and I was like, man, this has got all the key elements for a good horror movie. Yeah, and the score, we, we there's the score purposely has a little bit of Halloween, Elm Street, some goblin in there. I really uh, the the um the composer of his his handle is Savant. It was his first movie music score for movies. And uh, we really worked together on it to try to create that mood, a little phantasm in there too, in the end credits. Um, you know, so people w- would see this as kind of a, a love letter. And I thought the cast and, you know, shooting it this way would, would sort of elevate, you know, the storyline um, and, and make it something cool and different. Um, and I'm happy that you got it because, uh, again, like with Nightmare Man, this one is really getting uh, people <laughs> are just like – they seem to be offended that there's that someone made a, a horror movie that deals with sexuality, and you know the the response to that has has been like wow it's like really you can't show a bare breast anymore it's just like this, it's porn just total porn you know um, and in, in a way it's funny because the entity which which I don't know if you know or like a fan of that movie the Barbara Hershey movie oh yeah you know, when that film came out um, it, it got crucified by the you know the critics thought it was the most degradating misogynistic movie of all time and now everyone considers it to be a great movie and a classic and so I'm thinking well since I wait 20 years maybe the black room will catch on and <laughs> people will finally you know see it for like oh it's it, it's actually fun and and yes there's a sense of humor on purpose but I guess yeah when you're trying to combine humor with sexuality and horror you get into a, an area that makes people uncomfortable. But again, a good horror film is supposed to make you uncomfortable. It's not just supposed to be all fun and games necessarily. So um, the cast loves it, and uh, I'm very proud of it. And uh, I'm, I'm so happy that uh, that some people get it and appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, um, it's a couple things on that. I'm quite envious of it because I'm a film writer myself. And I remember when I watched it, I'm like, this was such a cool idea. Why didn't I think of something like this, you know? But um you know, it's funny you bring up the music because that was one of the questions I had, and you kind of answered it. But um, yeah, even in the very beginning, when the music starts playing, it shows kind of the the shots of the house outside, come almost like the '78 Halloween does. Um, yeah. The music even has a Nightmare on Elm Streetish type sound to it, and I just saw it as somebody who who took something that works and put their own distinctive sound to it, and. I got to be honest, you know, I watch a lot of horror movies and this is probably one of the best tracks I've heard since it follows. I mean, this was just a really good, uh, creepy sound. So I wanted to give you props oh, to you. Thank and you. To no, the, that's, uh, he'll love that. I mean, yeah. He, it, that was, it was funny because that, that theme, um, the, the composer is from, he's Norwegian and he did a lot of techno dance music and he's good, but it's totally wrong for what this movie was. I wanted a kind of traditional, I wanted something current, but I wanted a little bit of a throwback thing, too. And he was a, he's a huge fan of, of movie music and James Horner and all this stuff. And he loves Hellraiser, too. And, you know, so he understood it. He just never did it. But he he works from, like, moods and ideas and theme, and rather than themes. So he was creating just sort of ambience versus, like, giving me melodies. And I, I love Halloween and, and real themes. And the, he wasn't quite capturing it. It wasn't until towards the end of the movie when Natasha is going down to the basement in the black room with the flashlight that he finally wrote that piece of music. And as soon as I heard it, I'm like, okay, it's great, and that's the theme to the movie. The movie has to start with this music, and then we have to bring it into the movie three or four times, and that has to be the theme to the black room, which he didn't even understand that necessarily. But when I heard it, as soon as I heard it, I'm like, okay, that's it. So I'm like, okay, now we're going to put it in the beginning of the film and then interlace it through the movie, and then we can really build it up and let it explode at the end. Because um, I'm a huge fan of movie music and Jerry Goldsmith and, you know, <laughs> and all that stuff. So... Um, that's how it worked, and uh, yes, I'm so happy that to appreciate it. And then the opening title music, uh, which um, <laughs> it's funny because some people really hate the opening title music. It's it's a it's it's we would never have been able to afford that piece of music in normal circumstances, but because it was Cleopatra, they had the rights to it. It's uh, Emerson, Lake, and Palmer. It's Tarkus from the beginning, uh, performed with the uh, London Philharmonic Orchestra, nine nine ninety piece orchestra. So it's a huge, famous piece of music that people have been calling like this cheesy 70s TV cop show music. And I'm like, no, it's actually, <laughs> you know, pretty, pretty big piece of music um, that would have cost us probably $100,000 if we tried right. to actually buy the rights to it. So, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm so happy when people appreciate what the music is because that's the movie. I'm like, if you watch the first 10 minutes of this film, you get, you know, between the girl being seduced by the invisible spirit and with Lynn and, and the opening titles, it is a retro throwback feel, and if you hate it, turn off the movie now because you know I'm being very honest. This is what the movie's going to be, you know. But uh, if you if you get it, you get it, and I think people who get that opening really enjoy the whole movie and, and go for the ride. 
Definitely. And then the last thing I was going to talk to you about as well was something Andy touched base on Nightmare Man is the effects of the film were awesome. And, you know, the Incubus character, you know, you, it was all you gave us, you know, evil that we can look at. The demon looks really awesome. And I, and I looked up to see who it was and I noticed uh, I might say his last name wrong. It's Nick. Is it Persimp? Or Nick, Nick Principe played the demon. Principe, and, yes. Uh, and and v, uh, v, uh, VGP Vinnie Gustini Productions did our effects, and he's amazing. I've known him forever. I, this is finally it was the first time I was able to work with with Vinny. and he designed the demon and did the whole thing. And uh, and Nick, and Nick I had worked with before actually uh, on a crew member or something because he was uh, Chrome Face and uh, Chrome Skull in the, um, the Laid to Rest movies that uh, that Rob Hall did, and uh, and you know he loves playing killers, so he's a great demon. He's a big guy, nicest guy in the world, good actor, and. Uh, he was our stunt uh, coordinator, too, so he made sure no one got hurt when they got sucked into the wall and stuff like that. Um, but, yeah, Nick did a great job as the demon, and, uh, and I invented he designed a, an awesome demon that, uh, you know, we didn't, we didn't overuse. I wanted to show it, but I didn't want, you know, the, it's, you don't see it a lot in the movie. I think it's cool that way. Um, so I was very happy. And that whole flashback scene, uh, when we finally do see the demon in the 70s flashback, that was, again... A uh, really hard. That was one day to shoot that entire thing. It was <laughs> we had two cameras, but there was so many setups and so much time because we killed a lot of people. And uh, again, mostly practical effects, and uh, it was a massive sequence. But I'm, I'm very proud of that one too. Yeah, it was quite intriguing. Whenever there's a party going on, and all you hear is peace, joy, love, Satan. <laughs> <laughs> like oh no, that's, they need to get out Vic- right now. <laughs> yes, and that's Victoria Demar making her little you know part in that movie. She's uh, plays B- Batty Boop in the uh, Killjoy movies and many other films. But uh, yeah, that was <laughs> yeah, Peace Love Joy Satan. Yeah, that was uh, <laughs> yeah. She's very funny with that. Yeah, a lot a lot of faces. There's a lot of cool people, and it was nice to be able to to cast you know really good actors who I've known you know for a while and uh, put them in put them in the movie. Tiffany actually was offered a bigger role in the film, but she turned it down, and she said she wanted to play the real estate agent, so I went with her on that, because I think she also thought that um, since the real estate agent doesn't die, um, that you know, if there are sequels made, she could be a recurring character, which is very smart. Um, <laughs> so uh, so that, that was cool, too. She sounds like a businesswoman now. Oh, Tiffany's very smart. <laughs> oh, yes, she, she knows what she's doing. Yes. <laughs> well, uh, Rolf, I noticed that you've got uh, another... Uh, project come up that sounded really interesting it's called party bus to hell uh can you tell us a little bit of what that's about oh sure yeah party bus yeah we we i'm very happy right now because we i just finished the cut and handed it to the producers and they loved it they saw it last night about three o'clock in the morning and they're raving it all over facebook today which is great it's it's not finished yet we have about a month month and a half to go but uh um, we're, we're planning to have the premiere on October 30th in Vegas, and then we'll have an AFM, and we'll probably be in LA screening pretty soon. Perfect it's a Halloween movie. Um, yeah, Party Bus to Hell is uh, very different from Black Room, um, except it's a lot of fun. It's uh, it's just uh, it's a real roller coaster ride. Um, the producers had a concept, which was they was basically was a bunch of people on a party bus uh, breaks down the desert, and there's a cult group that sort of starts doing bad things. So when I heard the premise, again, going back to you know my knowledge of the older films, I immediately thought of this movie called Race with the Devil, which was a really cool film from 1976 with uh, Peter Fonda and Warren Oates and Loretta Swit. And, it's, and it still is a great movie. And I said, okay, so this is kind of Race with the Devil without the race since the uh, bus breaks down. So I came up with the idea of like a party bus of people going to um, Burning Man. And literally this turns into like the evil, almost satanic Burning Man um, then where a few people get trapped on the bus and it doesn't stop. Once the movie starts, and it starts pretty fast, um, it just keeps going. It's, it's a, uh, splatter comedy horror film, you know, a little bit going back to like the early Peter Jackson days and, uh, um, definitely some nods to things like Evil Dead and the Hills, ha- Hills Have Eyes. Um, there's, there's actually a line in the movie where when they're looking out and seeing, the cult members with, you know, they, there's, a, there's a lot of people get killed. It's, a lot of, it's also my biggest body count movie, like, ever. <laughs> and it's, again, almost all practical effects. But they, they've seen the cult members with the bodies, and they're saying, well, the hills have eyes, ears, noses, and throats. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> so, great. That, that sets up, the, yeah, I think, the mood of it all. Um, and it's fun. And then I got to work with Tara Reid, who, um, you know, who everyone knows from the American Pies and the Sharknado movies now. 
Um, so she was a lot of fun to work with in the desert. And uh, Devaney Pin, who's done a bunch of horror films. And um, yeah, we had a, we had a pretty good cast. It was done in Vegas, uh, mostly local talent in Vegas. And um, I think this this just be a, a great midnight kind of movie, beer and pizza, just have fun with your friends. And uh, it's it's tight, it's short, and just you know, <laughs> I'm hoping we get to some film festivals and this thing sort of takes off because. You know, it was a it was a difficult shoot. It was a it was a low budget movie, but we we pulled off some minor miracles on this one, and it's uh, it's action packed. <laughs> oh, and Sadie and Sadie Katz too, if you uh, if you know her from uh, Wrong Turn Six and the upcoming Blood Feast movie. She's also uh, one of the leads. She's great. She plays the uh, bus driver. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm definitely putting that on my uh, watch list. Uh, I want to check that out, especially you know since you you know mentioned the race with the devil. I, because I loved like those seventies horror movies like that. So yeah, I mean, that's, yeah. that sounds great. Um, but yeah, uh, Rolf, uh, you know, it, 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 we're very happy to have you on the show tonight, talking to us and, uh, letting the listeners get to know you a little bit better and get, getting a behind the scenes, look at some of your movies. So, uh, you know, we just want to say thanks for coming on the show tonight. Oh, no, thanks for having me. I, I was happy to talk about genre and movies and films in general. And, uh, yeah. And, Hopefully people will check them out more. And uh, Netflix, you know, people can see Black Room. And it is coming on, uh, Black Room comes out on DVD and Blu-ray. You know, it's my first Blu-ray release, finally, um, on sure. September 26th. Um, there's going to be a, a signing at, uh, in, in California in Dark Delicacies, a pretty well-known uh, horror bookstore in the Valley uh, with a bunch of the cast and crew. And there's a lot of bonuses on the, on the, uh, the DVD and the Blu-ray. We do a commentary track with myself and the producer and Augie Duke and Natasha Henstridge, and there's about 30 minutes of deleted extended scenes, um, which you guys might find kind of cool. There's a, a prolonged opening that's a much longer opening, and it's even more sexy and violent in the, uh, <laughs> the uh, deleted scenes. And there's some bloopers and storyboards and cool stuff, so we, we, we loaded it. Yep, and you know, you just you brought something up. You said Augie Duke, and I didn't even bring her up. She was amazing too. She was the doubtful sister with an attitude, right? Yes, she was great. Oh, she yes. was great. I, I, I had seen her in uh, Bad Kids Go to Hell and a few things, but um, a friend of mine who uh, handles her for convention appearances, Scott Ray, um, suggested her because again, I told you the script was written twelve years ago. So when I originally wrote it, I I, I thought Tiffany for that role. You know, because Tiffany would have been perfect for that role. But uh, 12 years later, it's like, mm, Tiffany's not really right anymore for it. But and, and I asked her, I said, who could play this? She goes, I don't think you'll ever find anyone as good as me. But we found Augie, and Augie blew it away. Yeah, I mean, she just, <laughs> you know, she was awesome and got along great with everyone, and I really hope to work with her again. And uh, she's, she's, a, she's a great person to have on sets, too. And fearless, and you know she. You saw some of the stuff she has to do in this movie. She was. She went for it. <laughs> because, oh yeah, and that scene yeah, she, will stand out to everybody who sees it. That's one of the most memorable sequences in that movie because you don't know what's going to happen, but then when it happens, you're like, "Holy crap! Did yeah. that just happen?" <laughs> that yeah, yeah. That's when you really pull. Yeah, that was. The, yeah, I'm very proud of that. That, that sequence is, is quite a scene, and uh, yeah, I'm surprised people don't talk about it too. I, I I think it's again. It's just the movie's a little too out there and people you know they're again look listen they're, they're sort of used to this sort of safe pg-13 s kind of horror and when you do something like that extreme you know it's in, in today's day and age with the pc environment people are like wait you can't do that i'm like why not it's you know <laughs> you know we're all adults here you know you're not supposed to be 10 years old watching this movie so i mean because yeah i said the black room's not rated but if it were it would be you know rated you know r for everything you know, we pretty much cover the spectrum. And and I say the same thing about uh, Party Bus to Hell. So my line has been that, um, you know, if you didn't like The Black Room, you're going to hate Party Bus to Hell. <laughs> oh, so I'm going to love it. All right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, the reverse it and you do that way. <laughs> well, Rolf, I'll tell you, you know, I'm going to do my part, definitely. And I know Andy will. Uh, we both love um, the things that you brought to the table. We're very much looking forward to the new stuff you have. And we'd love to have you on again in the future, you know, once things are a wrap. And if you got more stories for Party Bus and, and other projects, we'd oh, love to promote. Sure. And I'll tell you one thing. I'm going to go on IMDb and give you a rating for that black room. We're going to get that thing pushed up. Oh, thank you. Yeah, 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 yeah. that would be great to do it. Cause, uh, yeah, and I've got more uh, on the on the horizon. There's um, – a vampire movie that I uh, had a lot to do with called Sunset Society coming out early next year. That's one of the last films that Lemmy from Motorhead was in and a bunch of other musicians. Um, and I, you'll, you'll see a scene with a vampire seduction that I don't think you've ever seen before 
in a in a horror in a vampire movie. I, I've never seen it before, <laughs> so I, I try to do something pretty original there. And uh, the same producers from Party Bus were talking about a new horror movie that I wrote called Art of the Dead. Currently, that's a really cool kind of thing dealing with uh, paintings and uh, the deal with the devil and the seven deadly sins. That I think would be uh, kind of a cool movie. So I'm hoping we get the money and get that thing off the ground too. So. More, more horror in the works. It's nice to be back in the genre because I jump around a lot, but uh, it, it's, uh, it's, it's always fun to work in, in, the, in the horror realm. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I would encourage everybody to go check out uh, Rolf's film catalog. He's, like you said, he's got things in many different genres and got, got a lot of good, good horror in there too. So, Rolf, uh, you know, just thanks again for coming on the show tonight. Yep, thanks again for having me. Thank you to all of our listeners out there. We really appreciate you guys tuning into our episodes. And stay tuned for next week. It's going to be the star of The Black Room, Lucas Hassel. And you can hear about all that he's got going on, uh, all the other projects that he's been involved with, and the things that he has coming up. And and then at the end of the month, we'll have our Exorcism movie chat with all three of us. And uh, you can find us out there on social media, on Twitter, we are at Black Cat Podcast, and you can find Dave at Phantom Dark Dave. We are also on Facebook and Horror Amino as well. And speaking of social media, we do have a contest going on. We just started it yesterday. What you got to do is either on Facebook or Twitter, you just got to like the post. There's a post on both about the contest. So you got to go to the post, like it, either share it on Facebook or retweet it on Twitter. And then send us a message with the answer to the trivia question, which is, uh, what does Katie and Mika watch during their downtime while they're shooting the first film? Either send us a message on Facebook with the answer, or send us a message on Twitter with the answer. We will pick a random winner out of the answers that we get. And uh, the prize is, it's the complete Paranormal Activity Collection on DVD. Get in on that. Um, It's a cool collection. It's a cool franchise. Uh, we're big fans of it here on the on the show. You can email us at blackcatpodcast at gmail.com. If you'd like to send Dakota an email, he is at daxshadowbane at gmail.com. That's D-A-K-S-H-A-D-O-W-B-A-N-E at gmail.com. You can find our website at www.blackcatshadow.com where you find all of our past episodes. And the links to where you can download them and listen to them whenever you like. And also you'll find the link to our Black Hat Shadow movie store. Where we have lots of cool movies. uh, DVD, Blu-ray, VHS. So go over there and check it out. You might just find something you like. So for, for me, Dave, and Dakota. Thank you guys for tuning in. And remember to take a closer look at the world around you. And you may just find that it is stranger and more mysterious than you thought especially in the Black Cat Shadow.